What's up, everybody? This is a special guest episode with uh, my pal returning guest, uh, Cecil Porter. What's up, buddy? <laughs> What's up, man? So we're going to uh, try something new. Uh, last time you were on the show, we talked about art. We talked about motivated. It was pretty much like your whole story. We went through it and uh, got a really inspiring story about like not giving up and working hard. And uh, as I've said last time you're on the show, it's like you're one of the most like hardworking and creative people I know. You're just like nonstop making stuff like <laughs> constantly and uh, it's super like admirable. Um, so this time we're going to try out something new. You're going to be painting something and I'm going to be painting something. And if you guys are listening to this in podcast format, uh, you can go rewatch it or watch it for the first time on our YouTube, youtube.com slash rancig. And as we talk, you can watch us uh, paint. So, or you can just listen to us talk. Either way, it's going to be fun and interesting. So, so, uh, all right. I mean, okay. Now I got my thing up here. So, uh, man, so much craziness has happened since we last, uh, talked. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, yeah, a lot. Go ahead. No, just a lot of stuff. Just everything crazy has been happening, man. It's is uh, everything. Everything has changed. It's all changed. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess my my first uh, conversation starter is like, how are you handling this quarantine business? Are in completely like structures of life and everything has just completely changed. Um, as far as the quarantine goes, nothing's really changed for me. Mm -hmm. Uh. You know, I mean, I'm just every day I'm, I'm pretty introverted. So every day I just pretty much spend doing art anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that sucks now is that I'm not getting paid for it. <laughs> yeah. Now you hear that. It's, uh, it's weird. Yeah. Cause like Randy and I, it's like, it's not much different for us either because, you know, we, I don't know, when you work from home, you kind of, we're sort of hermits anyways. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. The, I think the, the downside is, um, I don't know. The schedules are a little bit more screwed up because, you know, Ashley's home all day. So I, I, my, everything's, everything's just a little bit more screwed up. So my, my hours are different, you know, than what I'm used to working. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it's, uh, still putting in the same amount of hours every day. I don't, I don't feel like any of that's changed. Yeah. I think for me, it's weird because like knowing that I can't go out is sort of makes me, feel more stir, stir crazy than I normally would. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I think, and it's like, I don't know if I'm just like feeling the collective whole as you know, just everybody's feeling all cooped up now, but yeah, it's weird. Cause normally I'm like, I, don't I, know, you, I stay home. <laughs> the thing, the thing that's, um, it's been a little bit weird to me is that I, I always complain about never having enough time to do anything. <laughs> and now I got more than enough time to do everything, but I feel like my drive has dropped. Hmm. I don't know if that if that's yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, I think a lot of it is I've been bummed out just because of the economic impact of all this, you know, mm -hmm. like obviously I'm not making any money now. And then even if like, let's say we all get to go back to work on the 30th, um, it's not like there's going to be a line of people trying to get work for me immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, it, when you're in an industry that I'm in, uh, you're you're a luxury. Nobody needs to get, you know, hire an artist or anything. So I'm kind of like how long is it going to take even after all this settles down before I start getting work again? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been wondering too. It's like, uh, you know, people always need art during dark times, but I mean, it's, I guess it's still too early to know how it's really going to affect me. I mean, I just got a sculpture commission, uh, like yesterday. So that was super rad. Um, so there's people out there like still wanting to spend money on art. Uh, but it's just, you know, like how long, how long is this going to go? And, you know, I think the longer it goes, the, is that going to drive people to want art more or less, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I, I haven't made a penny in three weeks, so, um, it can't really get any worse for me. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. just going to continue down this road until it's not. I think it's interesting because I have a lot of friends that are sort of, uh, it's forcing a lot of people to branch out and figure out new ways of making money, uh, and get creative. Like I know a friend, Sin, she, she's a dancer and now she started doing like dancing, uh, virtual dances. And like, that seems to be like working out for her, which is cool. 
um, I don't know. We're spending a lot of time making videos and <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's cool. Like, I don't know. It's, I think, I mean, I did have some work lined up that fell through because of everything, which is a bummer. So it's all same here. Yeah. yeah. Same here. I had six jobs fall through. Yeah. So I don't know like what, I don't know. It's kind of scary. <laughs> I mean, it, I, it, it, go ahead. In, ta- in tattoo land, I can't do any tattoos because um, the quarantine and, of course, nobody wants to spend money right now. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in, uh, in art land, you know, like every art director I've talked to has been like, well, we really right now the way things are shaped up is that we have to hire our in-house guys before we can hire a freelancer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's I'm struggling on that end because uh, I'm a freelancer. So mm-hmm. nobody wants to give me a job. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that's a double whammy on my side. And I get it. Like, you know, that's that's the that's the main reason why you would take a studio job. I think in most cases is it's it's a little bit more secure work than freelancing. Mm-hmm. Still not secure because it still is basically job to job, but it's more secure than freelancing. Yeah. So have you have you thought of any like creative ways to like bring in new ways I mean, of income or anything? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. It's not new. I've been talking for years about starting a Patreon and a Gumroad and all that crap. And uh, you know, I just every time I sit down to do it, it's always been a matter of like, well, I'd rather just be making art, mm-hmm. and then I don't do it. You know, or I, I start it and then and then something happens. Like if you remember when I started the. Uh, the YouTube channel, I was going strong. I was putting up a video, at least one video a week. Mm-hmm. And then both my computer and my hard drive crashed at the same time. <sighs> and and I lost I lost 10 years of stuff that was on my computer. Jeez. It's gone. And I mean, everything from like photos of my kid to, you know, I mean, I lost it all. So um, that was a little bit disheartening. And then I was just kind of like, screw it. I don't even want to do this anymore. And, uh, I, you know, basically haven't done much on my YouTube, if anything. I don't even know if I've done anything since that. Because originally, you know how it is with YouTube, man. you got to build up content so you can continually post because if you miss a week, people, you know, kind of take it out on you. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to, you know, recording stuff to post, you know, to try to build up my catalog again. And then I just, I never really did anything with it. So now, because of all this, I don't really have an excuse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, uh, I have no income coming in, so I have to do something to make income. So, um, trying to put together tutorials, you know, do the Gumroad thing, and then uh, I've got about eight or nine videos already for the Patreon, and uh, I still have to record audio for like seven of them, and then I'm going to start, you know, loading. Probably I'm going to aim for two videos a month on the Patreon, and then uh, hopefully, you know, get some income coming in that way. It's not a lot of money, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, I only know a couple people that, quote unquote, make their living off of that stuff, and mm-hmm. most of them live in cheaper states than I'm in. So, you know, it's just, it's like it's things that are good for supplementing your income, yeah. but it's not anything that's going to replace my income. You yeah. know, so it's that's a permanent problem. I got to figure out somehow. Yeah. Which, speaking of which, uh, the drawing that you are currently doing, uh, if you're going to put that up on your Patreon or Gumroad or something for a tutorial? Yeah, it'll be on Patreon. Um, it's just the it's the femme fatale from my comic. Um, I'm just coloring in some sketches of her face. Nice. Just uh, to try to get a feel for the character a little bit better and whatnot. Which and comic? I just, you know, I figure uh, for uh, Apple Jacks. Cool. You want to explain that, that a little bit? Uh, Apple Jacks is just, um, it's like a crime noir based in the Lovecraft universe. Nice. So, you know, it's like a crime noir slash cosmic horror. Yeah, dude, any um, of the panels you've shown me yet, I fucking, I love it so much. Like, it's... yeah, I'm, I'm killing myself on it though, man. I'm doing, I'm doing dumb stuff. Cause like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit anal about my art. So I, could, really? I should, I can't, I should be going in. And doing like, you know, you really only, I mean, there are guys who do more than this, but you really only need one establishing shot per page. And I'm doing like full blown backgrounds for every panel. I'm doing like three point perspective for every panel. And like that kind of stuff is really sucking up the time, <laughs> but it's going to look awesome. You yeah. know, and that's the thing. Like there's books that, that are 
like that out there that I love. Like there's a, a, a noir book called Black Sad. I think it's, I want to say it's made in France. Um, but uh, it, it, the guy who does that, man, like he's just, he, I wouldn't say it's definitely not three point perspective for every panel, but I mean, more often than not, the panels are fully fleshed out. You know, it's just like full backgrounds and everything. And I love it. Mm-hmm. You know, and, it, and it, you could definitely tell it's a it's a labor of love kind of thing. And there's not a lot of books to do that. And that's one of the advantages you can have by doing your own book and not like being beholden to a monthly schedule. Like, you know, when I was doing stuff with Marvel and things is you have so much more time to put it in there. But then the downside to it is, is that you're not getting paid until it's done. Yeah, it's true. Um, I, <laughs> dude, I love your like. I love the, a lot of the stuff I've been seeing you from lately is like a little bit more like cartoony and, uh, you know, loose and flowy. And I'm, I'm digging that. I like it. That was that. So I don't know the whole time I was in, you know, I, I hate to be told what to do yeah. the whole time I was in school. They were telling me like, you need to loosen up your style. You need to, you know, let go of the detail, this, that, and the other. They did not mean what I'm doing. They meant a little bit more like uh, impressionistic kind of fine art stuff. Right. Uh-huh. And I didn't, uh, I didn't want to do it because they were telling me to, to be honest. And I know that's a stupid attitude to have. And I didn't mean to have it. But in, in hindsight, I can be like, well, I really did fight against that, you know. Uh-huh. And you know, part of that is I didn't want to change my style. I didn't go to that school to change my style. I went to that school to try to build up my weaknesses. Uh-huh. But there are things about my style that I like and things that I, I'm known for. Like I get jobs because of how I use color. I get jobs because of my attention to detail. Like that, those are things that – a clients and art directors point out to me. So I didn't want to lose that. Uh-huh. But then, um, right before all this happened, I got, uh, a job, um, doing like brand design basically for a cereal company. Uh-huh. And, uh, I, I don't know honestly, like why they would choose me because it was all animated style stuff, uh-huh. which I have zero experience at. <laughs> um, but, I also hate to turn down jobs. Uh-huh. And so I was like, yep. Oh, I totally can do that. No problem. <laughs> and so I had to like really fast learn how to do like an animated style. And, and, and as I was doing it, I think just cause I like to learn new things. And, um, this was so different than, I mean, cause I've pretty much worked in a, either a very, like a pretty realistic comic book style, uh, or, just in, in, you know, photo realism Mm -hmm. for pretty much my entire career. And so to sit down and, and like do just this straight up cartoon style, you know, it was like a crash course because I had to get this job done. So it was like, I had to learn how to do a cartoony style and I was just, man, I was having fun. And so I was just like, I have all these stories that I've written, but you know, like I've been working on red for eight years Uh or something. That's because it's all in a realistic style. It just takes a buttload of time for me to, to do that style. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, man, what if I, what if I retooled some of these stories and did them in, in my animated style and just seen what happens. And so I, I picked cause I'm, I mean, probably my favorite author is Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was one of the first stories that I wrote, which, you know, to be honest, it's, it's not an amazing story, but, I thought like that would be the one that would really be cool, um, in more of an animated style. Mm-hmm. As, long, you know, as long as I, as long as I kept it real, as far as like the content goes, and not slapsticky. Like, there's a book called Chew, and uh, maybe even that's not even the best example. But I'll use that one anyways. There's a book called Chew, where um, it takes place in, a, in an alternate universe where the FDA is the most powerful government agency, and you're not allowed to eat. Uh, chicken and stuff right so okay they have they they chicken is like the worst thing and so uh they have an agency set up for it and the, the people in this agency to like bust the people who are doing like the illegal chicken smuggling and all this i'm butchering <laughs> this story but anyways they they uh the people they can eat like corpses pieces of dead people and they can see like their past their their how they died, everything that happened to them, they can see all that stuff. Okay. And so it's a pretty, it's pretty dark. I mean, like there's times where like, you know, they have to eat like cremated ashes of people and, 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 um, so it's drawn in a very cartoony style Uh and 
because of that, and you know, this has been used in other mediums too. This isn't like a new trick, but because of that style, uh, it adds like a lot of levity to it uh-huh. and it never really feels like grotesque or anything. You know, it, it, it just makes it like just kind of black humorish. Okay. And because there's a lot of like really evil shit going on in, in Apple Jacks, I thought, well, this, that'd probably be the story to try it with. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I started doing it, I was just like, man, this is fun. This is, this is <laughs> really, really fun. And so that's it. I just, uh, ever since I've just been, um, doing Apple Jacks in like that over the top kind of animated style. Yeah. I would say like, that's, it, it really shows that you're having fun in it, you know, I think that's the immediately that's what apparent. Says. Yeah. That's what, it, that's what everybody says, which is surprising to me. Um, but I like it. I like that because I, I've never heard that really about anything that I've done. <laughs> um, you know, so it's cool that people were like, man, you can just tell something about this art is fun to you. And I, I do love cartoons. Like, I think, I think we talked about this last time, but, um, if you remember, like I used to try to do like a fusion style and then I got that critique by Neil Adams and he, you know, he was basically like, don't, don't do this. Just <laughs> don't do this. And kind of was like, you need to focus on a realistic style because you can tell that's where strength is. Uh-huh. And so, um, I did, I put all, I shifted at that moment. I shifted everything onto that style and I really haven't looked back since. And I, you know, I, I do really, really enjoy it now. Cause I've kind of retooled my brain to appreciate it. And, but I haven't done in another style, but so this, this, even though it's more of an animated style and less of a fusion style, um, it still does kind of remind me of like, man, remember when I used to want to draw like this? <laughs> and so it's been a lot. Of- well, I think it's, it's cool to think about that because it seems like, you know, he told you that it's like, it sounds like it's exactly what you needed to hear at that time. Because yeah. it, you know, it I mean, made you like dive into realism. Today. Yeah, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for him. Because I didn't, I didn't focus on realism because it came easier to me, mm-hmm. you know. And I think I kind of took that for granted. And then uh, it wasn't until he really kind of pointed it out, then I kind of like went back and, you know, he sort of did that whole, you know, you want to do this style that you suck at because you suck at it, <laughs> and you need to stop thinking. You know, you need to focus on the things that you're naturally, you know, able to do. Um, but I feel like with this animated style too, like I've, I've been sending you the videos and stuff of, of the sketches that I've been doing and, uh, like the one of me and then the one of the girl, I think I sent you that one, right? The one that I just did of the, of the, the girl with the, all the pink and stuff. Did I send you that? I can't hear you. Oh yeah, you did. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, that, that, that's, I mean, like, I think I sent you the sketch too. If you look at the sketches, they're really, really, really cartoony. But when I put my rendering over top of them, they, they take on like a, a more realistic feel. And I, I kind of dig that style. I think it's really, I think it's really cool. And I haven't really seen that done too much. And so that's how I'm going to do Apple Jacks. And, uh, I like it. I think it's neat. I think it's a neat combination of, um, what I'm learning to do with what I'm already proficient at doing Mm -hmm. for sure. Oh man. Yeah. So just thinking about like this, this whole like quarantine and the economic impact and stuff. Like I honestly, I don't see if it, I mean, there are some estimates as like 18 months or, you know, like over a year. And it's like, I honestly don't see a way out of this if they don't pass some kind of like, rent like you know like if the big banks can't like i don't know like how are people going to pay their rent eventually you know i don't know the the thing is is like i talked to a lot of my friends in other countries and it seems like they all have like complete deferrals over there where it's like hey we as the government told you that you're not allowed to work so don't worry about your rent don't worry about your utilities don't worry about any of that stuff yeah, so you know, and it's, it's like, like, why are we not doing that here? And it's because, like, I I think it's because, like, the, it's just a big bank cronyism, man. Like, they, it's seriously, like, yeah. if, you, if you dig do any amount of digging into, like, corporate America and stuff, they're trying to squeeze the fucking penny out, out of every single person that they can. I guess. Yeah, and, it, and if you look at it, too, it's like, you know, this, 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 um, what, what do they call it? The stimulus package or whatever. You know, they're just like, I, I watched the fucking press conference and and the dude basically got up and he's like, 
you can all rest at ease, America, because we're going to, you know, give you $1,200. And I'm like, are these guys so out of touch that they realize that, like, that's not even half of most people's, you know, rent? Dude, it's like, you know, it's, it's a, honestly, like, it's a joke for California. Like, that isn't even a fraction of our rent. You know, it's just like. No, it's a, it's a joke for here, man. Yeah. You know, like, that's, that, that is half of, half of my rent for my apartment. That's all it is. You know, and it's like. That doesn't that doesn't help. And then and then, you know, I of course I tried to do the unemployment thing. You know, you have to swallow your pride right now. Yeah. And uh I denied. Yeah, I so dude, I, I, can't get I signed I signed up for it. Uh, I don't know if uh I don't know, I haven't heard anything yet. So it's like yeah, I don't oh, I, I don't denied, expect like What's yeah, that? I got denied like almost immediately. By the next day, I had an email telling me that I was not qualified. Oh. And I called and they were like, Yeah, in your situation, um, you know, I said I thought there was exemptions for you know, like freelancers and stuff like that. And she was like, Oh, there are, but that's only, it's only a percentage of, of freelancers that are going to get covered. And I don't fall into their little, whatever the category is that, that you need to fall into to be qualified. Jeez. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I get denied too. Cause it's like, I, I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't seem like something that I'm going to get. <laughs> and dude, I, it's crazy because like so many, like six, over 6 million people, probably more now have uh, applied for unemployment. And you know, most states are still on all of their unemployment systems are still on this super outdated, uh, cobalt coding, cobalt coding system. That's like yeah, 60 I've seen the years old. Yeah. And it's now yeah, they're, and they're like trying scrambling to get people to, to sign up people. on like, yeah, they're trying to get people to sign up on like a, a browser or whatever it is, the a server that like doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah. And it's like, they, they're right. scrambling to find me, coders. You see me keep looking over. Yeah. If you see me keep looking over to the right, it's because I have you on that computer and it's just like a habit. Cause, uh, well, that's fine. You're, yeah, yeah, we only see like a tiny webcam. little bit of your face. It's okay. Um, oh, that hurts my heart. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, it's like. That's what my mom used to say too. <laughs> as long as I only have to see a tiny bit of your face. <laughs> um, um, where? Yeah, I don't know, man. It's, a, it's, a, it's rough right now. Um, you know, like I have multiple friends who have also tried to get unemployment and they either haven't heard anything back or have been denied. And I'm like this, this, you know, thing about helping the freelancers, boy, I sure ain't seeing it. Yeah. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are a lot of freelancers out there that it is helping, but for some reason, the artists that I know, uh, myself included, we seem to be exempt from it. And I'm like, I thought that was what it was for. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm uh, you know, like, it's it just it, the whole situation just seems like a powder keg. Like, I don't know, man. Like, it, it doesn't. It, this doesn't seem sustainable. <laughs> I I know personally, it's not sustainable if I can't start getting work soon. You know, <laughs> like. No, that's the thing. Like, I don't know when I'm going to be able to get work. And it's like, yeah, they can't evict me right now. But when this is all done and over, they're going to expect me to start paying immediately. Yeah. And they're not going to understand, like, hey, uh, because I. I what I do for a living as a luxury, I may not get work for a couple months. They're not going to understand that. They're not going to give a shit. Yeah. You know, you know, the fucked up thing too is like, here's a, here's an interesting topic. It's like a lot of people think that artists don't have real jobs, but like now that shit hits the fan and nobody has anything to do, what's everybody doing? Watching Netflix, yeah. like reading books, like all the, like you're enjoying the arts right now because uh, like you have nothing else to do. So it's like if, if the thing we that I, weren't like creating things for you guys to enjoy and do like you'd be losing your fucking minds right now, you know? Yeah. The, the thing that I say to everybody uh, when they want to, you know, kind of have that art is an important sort of mentality is like no matter what you consume, there is an artist involved mm -hmm. in, in the very early stages. I don't care if it's buying a tampon. Somebody designed that. That's true. I never even, you know, like, really think about the that. The box that, that they come in, you know, the box that the fucking tampons come in. It doesn't matter what it is. There is an artist involved in the process, you know? Mm -hmm. And and it's like every every aspect of everything that you consume, there was an artist involved. And you want to act like it's not an important career, you know? And it's like, man, if you're good at this, if you're good at this job, there are people who will see value in it. Uh, but boy, the, the general populace, they just treat it like, Hey, this guy's just trying to make a, make a living off of a hobby. Yeah. And it, like it, everybody, I see so many posts about entitled artists and stuff. And it's just like, dude, 
<laughs> like spend years of your life trying to figure out how to do this shit and then tell me like if you're in you know what i mean like it's a skill just like anything else yeah yeah i mean i've, I've devoted 25 years of my life to get as good as i am and there are guys out there that smoke smoke me because they've had uh better tutelage or they've spent longer you know a longer period of their life trying to get good as well i mean it's it's just like anything else that's why people give it up mm-hmm. you know everybody says they want to be an artist whether it's a musician or actor or singer or, or you know painting drawing whatever everybody says they want to do it then they try it and they go oh i'm just not talented like you so i quit and it's like it has nothing to do with talent yeah. i was fucking terrible and i'm still terrible at shit you know it's like sit down crank out you know i tell this to people that i tutor online and stuff all the time you know, it's like I tell people, you want to learn how to draw a head, then, you know, practice the Loomis method, practice the Riley method, fill an entire sketchbook up doing the Loomis method, then fill an entire sketchbook up with the Riley method, and then do that over and over again until you can do it from memory. Then you can add in the planes of the face, and then you can add in this, and then you can add in that. And, it, and it's like they don't want to do it, and it's like that's why you suck at drawing head. Right. <laughs> you know, the, the guys out there who are the best at it, they did do that. Yep. There's no, there's no shortcut. You know, you want to be good at this? Well, there's really only one way to do it. <laughs> you know, there's definitely, you know, I would say there's, there's always going to be the one percenters, like those guys that just get it quicker, you know, mm-hmm. and you can see that in anything. I guess the best example would be like professional sports. You can see guys who are like that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean they have to work less. You know, it doesn't mean they have to continue to practice. The other thing when people are like, well, once you get good at it, you're good at it. And it's like, no, you have to continue to practice. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if you didn't have to continue to practice, then as a professional athlete, why would you ever show up to practice? You're already good at it. You know, it's like once you once you got it down. My, I remember Jeff used to tell uh, the students at school at his at his level of knowledge that he has now. He spends uh, more time practicing what he's learned to be able to continue to retain it at a proficient level than he does actually getting to use it in application. Hmm. You know, and, and it's like that's but he obviously understands an ungodly amount about art more than the average person, uh, more than the average artist. It, but still, like, that's the thing. Like, it's just it's a crazy amount of dedication. And then as soon as people realize that it requires just as dedication as being good at anything else does, they give up on it. Mm-hmm. You know, I tell people all the time, it's like, man, if, if I just spent 25 years studying law. I'd probably be an okay lawyer by now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, I just I don't see how people don't make the correlations, man. I don't know. It's just it's like art is the one exception where you know, like they would expect you to have to study your ass off to be a good doctor or a good lawyer or you know, good anything. But then when it comes to art, it's like, well, if you're good at it, you were talented. It's like, <laughs> man, I didn't have no talent. It was terrible for a really long time. Art was one of those things that definitely didn't come natural to me. I think, honestly, I think that's why I stuck with it because it was so challenging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a you have a very unique uh, story. I think, like, like for like an artist origin story. I mean, like, like you talk a lot about how like you were like really, really bad, and but then that, that's why like what allured you to it. I think a lot of people start in like. It's for me, I had like an inherent knack. Like, you know, I just. Oh, yeah. I, I, I look at the pictures of you when you were a kid and I'm so jealous because I'm just like, I wish I even knew that I wanted to do some form of art as a kid. Like, I didn't even try to draw for the first time until I was like 12. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, I look at the picture of you as a little kid and you've got like these homemade masks on and stuff. I'm like, man, that's got to be. It's got, seriously though, it has to be cool to like kind of have it figured out like as far as like what do i want to do for a living you know like yeah dude, that's pretty I, cool i you know and i'm not saying like i'm better than anybody or anything else like it's just i just intuitively inherently knew and uh, you know it's like that was just my origin story and like i'm thankful for that because like you know i as a kid like when i was younger in my teens and stuff when everybody was graduating high school there was a lot of people that had no idea what they were just about to go off and do. And I was like, I fucking, I, I know exactly what the fuck I'm going to do, you know? And it was like, I feel very blessed to have been able to be that like passionate and like immediately, you know, just know, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I knew, of course, by the end of high school what I wanted to do, but I had no support to do it. And then I was living on my own at 16. So um, I think my, you know, because I'm 40, man, I should be a lot further in my career than I am. And I think a lot of what, what held me back was just ignorance. I, I didn't know what opportunities they were. I didn't know how to pursue them. I didn't know anything. And, you know, it takes a long time to figure that stuff out, a lot of trial and error. And, um, you know, and that, that's why I try to help out so many young people now is because, you know, it's like, man, if, if I'd had the guidance, any guidance at that age, I'd, I'd probably be much further along. Like I was, I think I was talking to you about it. And I know I was talking to my other about it, buddy about it, man. Like I've been having like a serious, serious, uh, identity crisis lately mm. because it's like, I, obviously I want to be an artist forever. There's no, you know, well, until I die anyways. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that's going to change that. I, I love it too much, but it's not enough to say you want to be an artist. Like what kind of art? And now I'm not so sure anymore. Mm. I'm really not, you know? And it's like, even that's been, it's been that way my whole career. You know, like I thought I wanted to be a comic book artist and I worked in comic books and I was like, man, you know, I don't, I don't like having the restraints that, that come with working for a big company. And, and, um, you know, there's no money in independent comics, uh, at least, at least in the, in the beginning, and I had bills to pay, so I kind of walked away from that. Then I did the editorial cartooning, and that was fun. And I kind of, I built up a lot of steam on that pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't like I couldn't see myself being like, this is the this is the thing I want to do, mm-hmm. you know. And so then I tried this and I tried that, and everything I've tried, I've just been like, that's not the thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm 40 years old. I should have that thing figured out, mm-hmm. you know. And and you know, people are like, Oh, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it does matter because you really can't start climbing the ladder until you know, like, you can't say like, you can't just go, what do you want to do for a living? I want to be a doctor. All right. What kind of doctor? I don't know. (laughs) Then then you can't, you can't start a career. Uh It's the same thing with art. You got to kind of know what you want to do. And I don't know what it is, man. It's interesting that you say that too, because like, it's kind of, I'm a little bit there too, because like, I mean, in a, in a different sense, I guess, because like, I don't know, I do, I do so many things. Like I make music, I want to do video, I do this, I do that. And it's like, I'm overwhelmed with the things that I enjoy doing. And I've thrown so much spaghetti at the wall that like, I mean, I, I have a fan base that I'm very thankful for and I've developed a name for myself, but like nothing that I've done is like really caught you know, like in a no, big way that it, makes me self-sustaining in the way that I want to be. And when you do, so, when I, so let me, let me throw this at you. Uh-huh. Uh, this is something that I've been thinking about. Do you think that that is the best? And I'm not saying that I'm one of the best or that you're one of the best or anybody else, but just hypothetically, uh-huh. do you think that's the reason why some of the greats never get that huge name is because they, they can't dial it in, hmm. you know? Yeah, because like because like I look at guys that are out there that are like, man, that guy died poor. He didn't have a big name. You know, he eventually got a name or whatever. But it's like you look at him and it's like, man, this guy did everything. He sculpted. He painted. He did this. He did that. And I wonder if like is that part of what held them back was their their creativity? Yeah, I don't know. I think that's my thing. Like every time I think about what I would have to give up to focus on one thing, that bothers me more (laughs) than going. I have to focus on one thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's possible because like, dude, most of the big name artists like weren't famous until they were dead. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, um, yeah. And when you look at the guys, when you look at the guys that are big now, um, they're they're good. I'm not saying they're not. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not. I don't want to say any names. I don't want anybody to think I'm talking shit on them. Yeah. But they they know they're doing one thing, and mm-hmm. that's all they ever do. Mm-hmm. You know. Whether it's just I, I do figures, I do landscapes, I do plain air, I do this, I do that. They only do that. And it's like, I wonder if you really have to do that if you want to make it. Yeah. I don't know. It's tough because, yeah, even like right now, like I'm I'm like doing digital art. And it's like I that's I'm not known as a digital artist, but I'm really enjoying doing this digital art. Um, and it like I just I guess where I'm at is like I just got to. I had to keep following, I guess, my in- intuition, I guess, you know, it's like, I feel like, I don't know, I'm really, I feel like I'm really finding, I think what we have to do, people like you and I, is like, we got to find, keep doing until we find the groove of 
I feel like you just know it when you find it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to have that. I don't know. If, well, some, sometimes I don't know that I haven't found it. Sometimes I think, what if my thing is just doing everything? Yeah. But well, then so, that could be a that could be a, that could be a terrible thing because that could mean like well then you're never going to get successful. True, but I mean, but also like I don't think I want to. I wouldn't want to categorize that or think about doing so many things in that way. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't want to think that doing too many things is setting yourself up for failure. I think that I think if we if we're enjoying what we're doing, I think that we just have to keep doing it <laughs> until something sticks. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't know, the universe, the universe, um, I don't know, it has a way of working out. And I think, and, you know, people that always follow their passions, like pretty much every success story is always the same. Like, you know, I was doing this, I didn't think I was going to make it. And then all of a sudden one day fucking well, everything changed, right. you know? Right. But, um, not working your ass off and not pursuing your passions will lead to failure. But mm-hmm. working your ass off and pursuing your passions does not necessarily lead to success. True. And so that's the thing. If, if so, there's a lot of guys out there that bust their ass and work as hard as they possibly can and never make it. That's and true. It, and it and, and doesn't always come down to the fact that they're not good. So, I mean, it, 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 you know, you want to stay optimistic and you want to say those rainbow colored things, but that that's also a bit of a fallacy. Like you can't just say, well, as long as you work hard and stay passionate, at something you will absolutely achieve success. It's still very unlikely. You're just more likely to that way than you would if you didn't attempt at all. Yeah. You know, Ed, well, I mean, since I've gotten all like quantumly spiritual, I'll call it because there is like actual science that I, you know, uh, I mean, when you and I first met, we basically, we talked about, um, you know, like law of attraction type stuff. You know, it's like it was like intuitively something that we had learned in our lives. If we kept this resonant feeling and passion, something always gave way. You know what I mean? Um, And I think through experience, like we've both learned that that's that's how it works, even though sometimes I mean, when you're when you're in the thick of it and you're not succeeding, it feels like it doesn't work. But, you know, in my entire life, it's always eventually worked if i just kept at it and kept the you know the mindset that it is going to work and i wonder if that's the difference of between like people successful people and people that don't succeed is if they eventually lose that maybe because like the when i was talking about like quantum spirituality and stuff it's like the universe the way i look at it is like an open objective field and it re- it reciprocates commands that you put into it, but you have to give the you have to give the right um, ingredients to the universe for it to return uh, on your investment. You know what I mean? So it's I wonder if it just comes down to people that don't succeed is if they were almost there, and then if they would have kept going, they would have. And if they just they, well, I think that's ab- I think that's absolutely it. But that's that's a different point than what you had said originally, like the. The difference would be if you don't put it out there in a positive way, that doesn't mean you're not going to be successful if you're still busting your ass every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I, don't, I don't think that that's – I think that's a fallacy to think that way. Mm-hmm. But the thing is is that people who don't put it out there in a positive way are going to, just because of the psychological damage it's going to do to them by not trying to stay positive and not thinking that way, are probably going to give up. And mm-hmm. that's going to lead to failure. Mm. And there is tons of times where you've seen a guy who was just about there and finally gave up for whatever reason and then didn't make it. But that doesn't mean like if you if you're thinking about it in a negative way, as long as you're putting the work in, you still have just as much chance making it if you're thinking about it in a positive way. As long as you I mean, because that can carry over into different avenues, though. Right. Like, Because if you're being negative all the time around your friends, then you're likely to put that out during an interview you're likely to put that out in 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 uh in uh when you're trying to talk to an art director or where whatever your superior might be Mm -hmm. so you've got to be really careful about that Mm -hmm. but um i I don't know that there's a correlation between like i was positive and that's why i became successful versus i just worked harder than everybody else and that's why i became successful Mm -hmm. i think i think the only correlation would be the psychological side of 
if you're just negative about it and constantly going, I'm never going to make it, I'm never going to make it. Well, then you're going to be more likely to give up for sure because, you know, you, you kind of, you're going to just beat your, your wear yourself down. Mm-hmm. Well, it's weird because like I'm in this boat where it's like, I'm learning a lot of things that are like turning the way I view the world upside down when it comes to, like spirituality and stuff. And I, th- I don't know, man, I, I feel like there is, um, there, I, I mean, I know in my personal experience that there, there are things behind the scenes happening and guiding us personally. And I think that our unique, I think our individual experience is unique to us. And I think it teaches us whatever we're supposed to learn. And I believe that, you know, in reincarnation. So I think that if you end up failing, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you were supposed to, I don't know. See, then it gets into this weird like thing for me. It's because I don't, I don't like to think that way. It's like, oh, if you failed, you were supposed to. And then it sort of like opens up this whole like fate. And it's like, is it or was I just doomed to fail from the start? You know what I mean? Like it gets into the issue of like, free Bro, I, will think, and... I think, I think that becomes a slippery slope because then you start having scapegoats. Yeah. So then, then, then you could be like, well, I'm not really giving up, but it's just, it's not, it, it just wasn't meant for me. Right. Yeah. And then see, I don't like that way of thinking either. So it's like, I get into this like all the time. Cause I like it, it that's, that's one of the, the crazy things that drive the philosophical quandaries that drive me crazy about all of these things that I'm like learning. Cause it's weird because like, I, like, I don't, I'm not trying to convince you, you know, I'm just telling you my own experience and like a hundred percent believe that there's like shit behind the scenes. I don't know how it works yet. Um, and, and it's, I mean, you're not alone in that, you know what I mean? But there's just as many people who who have become successful and don't believe in that. Yeah. Right. And that's also what I was like, well, how did they get successful if they, you know, it's like, I don't yeah, know, I mean, the, the thing is, is, it's just like everybody's going to have their own belief system, whether it's a religion or not. Mm-hmm. You just do. It's just human nature. So mm-hmm. your belief system, you know, revolves around the things that you believe are true. And uh, my belief system revolves around the things that I believe are true. And everybody has that. And, you know, we tend to gravitate towards the people who have become successful with a similar belief system. So it's very easy when you have a belief system to be like, well, it worked for this guy and it worked for this guy and you get your little list of characters and you go, so that's the key. Mm-hmm. But the other guy has the same belief. He has his own belief system and has done the same thing. You know, I can be like, Hey, well, there's this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. And the only reason they became successful was because they worked harder mm-hmm. and that's it. Not because they willed the universe or not because of this and not because of that. Mm-hmm. Just it all came down to working harder and doing it longer. You know, yeah. and then I mean that's especially true in art. There's a lot of guys because artists don't quit for the most part unless they have to. And so you get a lot of guys that it's like, man, that guy didn't didn't make it till he was in his fifties. And then you start looking and you're like, wow, that's pretty common. Yeah. Why? <laughs> because everybody's still doing it. They're doing it well into their eighties. So it's gonna take a lot longer as an artist to make it. Yeah. In, in in a lot of cases, not cases. There are a lot of guys who, you know, manage to do it at a younger age. But in most cases, you look and it's like usually guys in their late 40s to their early 60s. That seems to be the area where it hits. Yeah. And then I guess and that's kind of like what I'm because tr- like, you know, with a reverentism, I'm trying to develop a a practical way of thinking that like encourages just people coming together in practical, productive ways. Uh, and it's just all about how you want to define it. I think like, basically, I think what it boils down to is if you can find a system of thought that helps you operate and navigate at your optimum levels, I think that's when you have the highest chance of success. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of it just comes down to, you know, kind of like stoicism really. It's just, um, be responsible for your action. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a it's a belief system. I don't know. It's it, um like I guess as far as like modern day guys who kind of you know base themselves off it. Jordan Peterson is real big uh, for it. Um, it's just really it's just really accepting responsibility hmm. for your, your actions. Is you know I mean I guess that's a that's a really dumbed down version of it. But yeah. you know it's just basically that like if you want something you have to work hard for it and you you just have to do it. And if you don't then you just have to realize it's because you didn't work hard enough. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I like I like schools of thought that in are individually empowering and and accountable 
You know what I mean? Like we have, we, we all need to be accountable for our own actions. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think that's the thing too, is like a lot of times people think, I'm good. How come I haven't made it? And then you look at it and it's like, well, being good isn't enough. You're not really out there putting yourself. You're not really, you know, and I fall into this category too, because the world has changed, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a technological world. And I see artists that, you know, a lot of artists I would, I would classify as like falling into kind of a mediocre category and they're making bank because they have turned around and they've done well on social media. They've done well on things like Gumroad, Patreon, YouTube, you know, and, and every one of these things, you know, comes together, adds up, builds them a fan base. They launch a Kickstarter, the Kickstarter stuff. I've seen it and, and I know it. Um, and yet I still fight it. And so I'm, I'm as responsible for it as anybody else. You know, it's a, uh, why haven't, why, why haven't I started a Gumroad and a Patreon, even though I've been talking about it for years, mm-hmm. you know, why, why have I not been active on, youtube even though i've been talking about it for years yeah i think it's if we if we just as guilty of it as anybody else yeah i think if we get really honest with ourselves we see if we really do some self-reflection and, and introspection and stuff we we see that like there are always things we could do be doing better you know and if and i think you really just got to be honest with yourself it's like am i doing everything i can be doing right now you know i, I don't think anybody ever is yeah. You know, no matter how hard you push, you can always do something else. I guess so. I, I think that, but then that leads to the burnout. Things, you know, it's like you have to balance. Like, well, for some versus... people, for some people, there's plenty of people out there who, you know, do the 18 hour a day, seven day a week thing and never get burned out. You yeah. know, and well, are, yeah, and are it's, it's wildly funny. successful because of it. Yeah, and it, it's interesting too because I feel like. I'm somebody that can definitely get burnt out, but I feel like you are somebody that definitely like can just like go and go and go like. You know, yeah, I'm not a great example though because I'm not wildly successful, but there are guys out there who are well documented for you know sleeping one or two hours a night, working all day long, never getting burned out, and just crushing it. Yeah, well, I just mean, like... I, I mean, everybody's different. You know, I, I know guys, I know guys like I used to think it was lazy to be honest, um, but I, I know better now. But I used to, I know guys that will work five or six hours a day and that's it, they're done. And I'm just like, what? That's fucking lazy, man. <laughs> like you never get anywhere. And then, and then, you know, now as I get older, I realize that no, it was just these guys have realized that they are putting their best work out for five or six hours, and then their work starts to suffer after that. It's mm-hmm. not that they don't want to keep working. They, they've gotten smart enough to realize that like I'm not working at the top of my game, and if I'm not working at the top of my game, that's going to end up costing me in the long run. Versus just stopping now yeah i I pretty much like i've realized like i think that's that's a good point for artists too that people should realize it's like you have to you have to get you have to start to understand your own personal workflow like are you a person that can like not never get burnt out or are you a person that like gets burnt out because taking a break from the work sometimes is just as important as the work itself um, because yeah, if you're, if you're burning yourself out, you're not putting out your best and you might be able, you might be one of the, I find that people that like get burnt out, they work sort of like quicker and more productively if you actually take that break than if you were to stretch it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it, it comes down to your job really. Yeah. Because if you're a studio guy, you don't, it doesn't matter if you're burned out, you're going to get fired if you don't get it done Yeah. and you work as many hours as it takes or you're fired. But if you have the luxury of not being a studio guy and you can kind of set up your own schedules and, and do your own thing, then, yeah, you want to you want to learn to become uh, acutely aware of when are you putting out your best work? Because now, especially if you're trying to make it as a freelancer, time doesn't matter. But also you have to justify why are you a freelancer? You know, so you, you've got to put out uh, as good or better work than the guy who's working at the studio and you have to get it done in a timely manner. So you, you really have to start to balance that whole, like, I have to be productive. Sometimes you just have to work up your stamina. Mm-hmm. You know, like some guys, they just, they haven't pushed themselves enough yet to build up that stamina to where they can finish a product when it needs to be done. And other guys never will. They just don't have it in them. And in those guys, sometimes it's better to be a studio guy. Mm-hmm. I, I hope I'm making like points. Like this is the first time I've like worked and talked in a long time. So I'm like, am I, am I coherently wrapping up points or am I just like trailing off? <laughs>
I don't know. I mean, it, it all sounds fine to me. Okay, good. <laughs> like, uh, um, yeah, man. Uh, so yeah, well, here's, uh, I mean, you like politics. I like politics until I don't like politics, but, uh, what's, I mean, what's some of your predictions with like uh, everything is happening right now? Cause we're, I, I don't really try to predict anything. Yeah. I kind of just look at, I look at the facts that are released from people who aren't in power right now mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and just kind of see what they say. You know, like we were talking earlier today, um, with the, uh, uh, the economic stuff, you know, and it, and it's like, according to the people who are in charge of the money you know, on like a worldwide scale, uh, you know, they're saying that like 2021 could be a, an enormous rebound. And when they have their big meeting, their big yearly meeting, that's what they're going to focus on. Um, you know, so I just try to look at stuff like that and try to stay as unbiased as I can. I mean, obviously, you know, there are people I like and people I don't like, Mm -hmm. but I try to just look at, you know, uh, as close to the facts as I can and see like, okay, well this seems to be, and that seems to be like, I told you, you know, we, we had a conversation about you saying like that Bernie Sanders would, you know, still had a chance. And I told you a month ago, he didn't Mm -hmm. mathematically. He didn't like everybody who supports Biden would have to not show up. Mm-hmm. And you were like, well, no, he's, you know, showing signs of dementia and, and he still has a chance. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, that's that's your view on it. But when you crunch the numbers, it was just literally mathematically impossible. Uh-huh. There was no way that, that many of Biden's people weren't going to show up. Yeah. And then, you know, like you said, you were bummed because he pulled out and it's like, well, he should have fucking pulled out, you know, a month ago when he knew he didn't have a chance. And I know why he didn't, because it was more about keeping his voice and his views in the public eye, which is great. You know, mm-hmm. that's why I donated to Bernie's campaign was because I, I never really thought he had a chance of achieving that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I never really thought he had a chance of, even if he got elected, it just wouldn't work. Right. Because the way the politics are set up is you have your team on the right, your team on the left, and they compromise somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I didn't want somebody who's more of the establishment like Biden is because he's already close to the side I don't like. Yeah, pretty. So, he might as well be. So what happens, <laughs> what happens is his level of compromise isn't that different than what they want. Yeah. But if you were lucky enough to get somebody who's more progressive in there, like a, 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 a Bernie or even a Warren, who's I'm, I'm not super crazy about, but whatever, she's more progressive than, than not, um, then you have more room. So it's like going to a car dealership and being like, uh, this car is 50 grand. All right, well, I'll give you 45. Okay, how about 47? Cool. Or going to the car dealership and being like, this car is 50 grand. Well, I'll give you 20. Okay, well, let's settle it at 35. You've gotten closer to my goal with a guy like uh, uh, Bernie or somebody like Elizabeth Warren than you do with somebody like Biden. And yeah. that, that's why I wanted him to win. But, you know, the things that he wants, they're not going to happen. They're yeah. just not. It's, it's ridiculous to think they will. You, It would... It would it would require enormous systemic changes for that to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and they're not going to happen. Well, I was just wondering, you know, I mean, out. I feel like it's sort of, I mean, the current like crisis sort of definitely, I mean, it pushes the conversation into more of like, oh, it doesn't seem so radical when you have a pandemic sweeping the nation and the healthcare system sucks, you know? Well, no, it, it doesn't seem radical because it was impossible to give everybody a thousand dollars a month when Yang said it. But then yeah. as soon as this happened, yeah. everybody gets a thousand dollars. Yeah. So, so, you know, or it, it's just like, well, how, how is that? How is it impossible then? Yeah. It's not impossible. It's just, it's just, there's a system in place that isn't going to let it happen. Yeah. And all you can hope for is somebody who can get it closer to what you want than where it is. Yeah. Well, what I'm hoping is that uh, this quarantine gives everybody a chance to see uh, all of these things that were so impossible before somehow are just magically like, uh, you know, like uh, bandwidth. Like it's, it's dude, it runs the spectrum of like corporate greed because like it, I'm under the school of thought that cronyism has completely ruined America. Um, and, you know, like with things like cable companies and stuff, they just like were easily lifted the broadband like speed, you know, like, oh, well, why couldn't they fucking do that before? Like they wanted to cap it because uh, they could make money off of it, you know, and I, I don't see any. 
I mean, what's that? For the simple fact, I said I don't see anything changing in the long run. For the simple fact, or nothing, nothing significant, anyways. For the simple fact that this isn't the first time this has happened. You yeah. know, I mean, you can go, you can go back to the the Hong Kong flu uh, in the '60s. You can go to the influenza outbreak in '57. You can go to the Spanish flu. Um, these things have happened, and other things like the Great Recession, the Great Re- the 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 Depression. You can look at this stuff. And things will change for a minute or two, and then they go back and usually become worse. If you look at the recession, that really crushed our living wage. When the recession hit, people were still earning an okay living wage. Then everybody started to get paid less, get laid off, get fired, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then when the economy recovered, they didn't then bring the wage back up. Mm -hmm. And so people were worse off than Mm -hmm. they were before that. So um, just just given the track record of history, I don't see anything changing. I, I think that things will go back to the status quo uh, once this is all said and done. Well, I feel like I mean, except you maybe have to, our I, health system will 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 at least learn to be more prepared for something like this. Yeah, but also I think you have to take into account like the internet and society is changing. Everybody's much more connected now, and and it's easier to make people's voices heard. You know, I think. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I feel like to I what sit extent, more on though? the I'm more to what extent? Huh? To what extent, though? Yeah, the people's voices are more heard, but nobody's listening. It's just more people bitching to each other. It's not changing anything. Yeah, I guess. You, you get you you get you get the same you see, get the same shit. Uh, the people in power will not allow things to change, and the only people who can change it are the people in power. Yeah. Well. It, it doesn't benefit them. It doesn't benefit them. No, I know. In their yeah. eyes, to help us. No, that's so what I'm saying. Like, there to. has to. Be, I mean, like, I feel like this. I mean, they're they're just unfortunate. See, I here's where I'm at. Is like, I, I this is why I was so bummed. Is because like I thought that we were maybe at a timeline where, you know, hey, like we can all just get our shit together and realize what's important, and then we'll like Bernie Sanders, and then there we go. Things are going to start getting better. But that didn't happen, and I think, and now I'm realizing we're in a timeline where shit's gonna have to break really bad, and shit's gonna have to really hit the fan before any kind of like true revolutionary change is gonna happen. And it like, did break really bad, and it did happen, and nothing changed. What do you mean? If anything, point? the people in power got more. You can you can look at the depression. Nothing changed for the better out of that. You can look at the recession in the '90s. What changed for the better out of that? Well, I'm just saying, see, but here's the thing is like each time that happens, we have that historical context to hopefully learn from. So, yeah, but get, we don't. Uh, well, we I, haven't. I, Nothing's changed. We and they keep repeating yet. the same cycle. I say yes. Okay, yet. I mean, but I'm obviously is, way more optimistic than you are, which is why I like having yeah. this conversation because well, like I'm not saying you're thing, wrong. I'm just, you know. No, I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I just I just look at the history and and I just try to look at how things have played out and the thing is, is that every time something like this happens, we willingly give up more and more and more of our rights, mm-hmm. and they don't get returned. That's that is definitely nope. true. It, that is very true. Like after nine eleven, completely look, changed the travel industry. Um, yes, and, and look at all the rights they've taken away right now with the pandemic. Yeah, and I'm not saying that it, that they didn't need to, but mm-hmm. what I'm saying is, people rolled over and gave up those rights without without an utterance. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is like when this is done, if they were not to give them back, what would change? Mm-hmm. We so willingly gave them up if they if they used the proper rhetoric and convinced us that it, that it wasn't safe to give those rights back. No, the, not enough people would fight against it to yeah. make a change. There would be people who would. But that's such a the vocal minority does not affect change. Mm-hmm. You know, it's in it, in. That's the thing is like in every one of these situations throughout history, when you look at it, people willingly give up their rights as soon as the government says, we'll help you, but we have to do this. This has to be done this way. Yeah. And people go, all right. Yeah, fine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like it, it, what, what incentive do the people in power, the people making the money, the people with that, you know, wield the baton, what, what incentive do they have to change when it doesn't benefit them and there are no repercussions. You could strip that down to, to a really relatable uh, dumbness, if you want, by looking at Trump. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether you like him or not, every time he's been told to do something, he says no, and there's no repercussions. So more and more people in his organization 
do follow suit. We need you to show up to the subpoena. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and nobody did anything. Mm-hmm. You know, we need you to do this. No, nobody did anything. You know, it's to the point now that where he can literally get on TV and say whatever he wants to say. And even though there are real time fact checkers, people go, no, that's not the facts. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's right here. We're not making this up. Yeah, you are. I know. It's, you know, it's, it's when, when that is the majority. Why would they ever change? Yeah. Why would they ever help? Would they ever do the quote unquote right thing? Yeah. They have no incentive to. They're mm-hmm. just richer and more powerful with no repercussions by doing the wrong thing. Well, see, here's what I, what I, my, like, I mean, I've tried to stop. Yeah, I'm, not, like, I'm not trying to be a contrarian. Oh, no, I'm no. not trying to be a contrarian. I, I i want to believe what you believe oh yeah no, I, I wish no, I, I like no and i like that you offer like you're you're bringing like real perspective and it's true like you're not wrong like i um i'm just like i i like that you come from that perspective so we can have this conversation but um i think that for things to truly get better because see here's the problem is like once trump's gone everybody's like oh if trump gets out like problem solved man everything is good but like dude trump created the trump cult and the Trump cult is yeah. not going to leave with Trump. You know, like that is a huge rip. To the... My my biggest problem and the biggest thing that pisses me off is that people go, well, I'm not going to vote for Biden because the guy is clearly showing mental decline, whether it's dementia or not. Mm-hmm. And at this point, anybody's better than him. And it's like you're a fucking idiot. And, and 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 I'm sorry, whoever feels that way, that I might be hurting your, hurting your. Uh, Wait, anybody's feelings. better than who? Wait, like, what's your what's your point? You're anybody's to say? anybody's better than anybody's better than Biden is what a lot of people are saying right now. And and uh, I I have a big dis because there's a lot of people there are not a lot of Trump people. There's a lot of Democrats and especially the progressives are so upset that Biden is quote unquote our man. That they've literally come out, and this is not a small amount of people, and they're like, I re- I'm either not going to vote or I'm going to vote for Trump because I will not let, you know, Biden in because of blank mental mental decline. He's too he's too corporate already. Blah 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 blah. Whatever. Yada yada yada. Uh-huh. And the problem with that is fine. Trump's only going to be there for another four years, sure, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg is going to retire probably in the next year. Mm-hmm. And then Trump's going to appoint another Supreme Court judge. And that isn't only going to affect my lifetime, but my kid's lifetime and possibly even some of my kid's kid's lifetime. Mm-hmm. The, the thing that people need to consider isn't the short term here. Mm-hmm. The thing that people need to consider is the long term ramifications of having Supreme Court justices or judges that usually stay there until they're dead. And and in them being of the mindset of Trump, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, th- there are people out there that are that are Democrats that you know, like you know, um, the, the that women have the right to to have an abortion. Well, they've been fighting against that since Kavanaugh got in. You mm-hmm. get rid of of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and now you've got a majority of people who can who can overturn Roe versus Wade. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the people need to stop thinking on a, on, a, on, a, on a temporary or petty level of, well, I don't like Biden, so I'm uh-huh. and And then think about the long-term effect here, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think Bader Ginsburg is, what, 86, 87? What are the odds that she's going to stay there for another four years? Mm-hmm. Just, just, just to try to make it so that hopefully a Democrat gets in and then they can replace her with another, you know, Democrat. Uh, not likely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, and that's the thing that pe- people they, they they throw their little hissy fits because they don't like this guy, they don't like that guy, and it's like, man, you can't you can't think like that. You have to think about what what other things can he do? Yeah. Well, also, I mean, I feel like so. Here's my problem with the vote blue, no matter who, is that it sort of puts like no accountability on the candidate itself. It's like it's almost like we're treating it like when you say no matter who. Uh, then it's like Biden doesn't have to do anything except not be Trump to win. When if like if we yeah, as a I mean, collective, that, that, we were, that, that, but I mean like well, so my that, point is is like if we were a collective and we're like you know somehow being vo- like 
maybe it's it's up to Biden to sort of like court a, a wider fan base. It's like that's 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 the candidate's job is to try to appeal to as many people as possible. So when you just say that like, eh, you're not Trump, then he doesn't have to do anything. So like while I like I totally agree with you about the Supreme Court thing. Um, but also I think it's it's sort of damaging and it always ends, puts us in this lesser of two evil scenario when everybody just says, eh, no matter who, as long as you're not Trump. You know what I mean? Right. No, you're absolutely right about that. But we're not the only side playing that game. There are tons of Republicans who don't like Trump, but go, well, he is the lesser of two evils. It's either him or Biden. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's not it's not like you can't just look at it as, as it's it's not it's not a problem that only Democrats or only Republicans are dealing with. It again goes back to we need a huge systemic change that mm-hmm. isn't happening right now. It is probably not going to happen in the near future if it happens at all. So we have to play the cards that are given. We have to play the cards that were dealt, whether we like them or not. Mm-hmm. There's nothing you can do about that. You have to look at you have to look at literally as you said, the lesser of two evils. Who's going to do more damage based on my ideology? And and do I like Biden? No, I, I'm a I was 100 percent in for Bernie, man. But you know he doesn't play the game, and if you don't play the game, you're not going to win. Mm-hmm. It's that easy, you know. And and it's like part of me was like I wish he would just play the game, get elected, and then do what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. But he he won't. And he, and and you know he doesn't he doesn't need to. And he you know props to him for sticking to his guns for you know as many decades as he has. Mm-hmm. But because he doesn't play the game from the get go, you know, like that's why Biden didn't take anything before Super Tuesday serious. He didn't, he knew he didn't have to, you know, and, and let's see, look, so here's the thing. Even if Bernie would have gotten the majority, if he didn't get the, what is it? 1920, then it would have went to super delegates mm-hmm. and almost all the super delegates would have voted for Biden. And then Bernie would have been out anyways. Yeah. Well, if you don't play the game, you really stand very little chance. Yeah. No, I mean, it, like, it's it's tough, man, because, like, I want to believe that there's it, it's just the game. And that's, like, it certainly is. Um, but there's so many fucking levels to politics that, like, we can't even know. But, I mean, like, I do know that it's, like, it is a fact that they uh, cheated Bernie on, like, you know, two, 2016, like Debbie, Debbie Wasserman yeah. Schultz, like, bullshit. Like, that's just straight up yeah. legit, like, out there. Like, yeah, they're like, yeah. Nobody, nobody, nobody even, nobody even um, goes against that. Yeah. You know, like, like, I mean, like, even, even, so even, so even Rob talks about it. Yeah. The, the thing is, is that, again, it needs a systemic change. You have to have a lot of money to win in politics. And in order to get a lot of money, because the way our system's set up, you have to play the game. You know, you have to accept that pack money. You have to accept the money. And, and Bernie wouldn't do it. And, you know, again, credit to him. And, and you know, the thing is, is that that's why the people who like him like him. You know, one of the reasons. And, mm-hmm. and it's just like, that's great. But, you know, you can see because of how the system's set up, how, you know, a guy like that or a person like that, I should say, is kind of doomed from the get-go yeah it's just a bummer because like man like it is i mean it, look i'm not no I'm I, not, I know that we have the, we have the same political values yeah, like, yeah, yeah i know and and, it, it, and i'm already trying to look to the future and it, look i'm not a huge uh uh tulsi gabbard fan mm-hmm. but i think that she's the one who maybe has the best chance going in um, next time because she's young relatively um, she plays the game to an extent and because of you know her her you know service background um, she doesn't take any shit mm-hmm. so you know I, I don't statistically if you look at the polling and you and you look at the numbers Biden can't beat Trump so I'm already looking towards the next one you know what I mean yeah. and, and, and you know I think that like you know, a lot can change in four years. Maybe she'll align Fuck, dude, more a lot with the can change in four months. Oh. Like, look at this year. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So, I'm just wondering, um, like, if you... I, I didn't, and it's like, well, this too, it's like informing my decision too. It's like, you know, the spiritual messages that we've been receiving and stuff, you can believe it or not, I, I, you know, but it's like, there's, there's some kind of big change because it's going to happen. 
and and it's a change that's going to shift into progressive human values and getting things to the kind of systemic change that we're talking about. And I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know, like, I be- like I'll just say, I don't know. I believe, I believe that something is going to, ha- it's going to fucking blow us all away, dude. Like, I don't, you can see that things are just like getting fucking nuts now, you know, like it's, it's like things are pretty crazy, you know, and I think they're only going to get crazier. And I, I don't know, I see something happening that is going to be in the best interest of humanity. I don't know how it's going to, but I think for that to happen, I think, unfortunately, some shit's going to have to break in a very big way that it, it's so public and so profound that, because if you think about it, like the only way to, in an the only way to solve the Trump cult problem is if Trump has some epically undeniable, horrible fuck up that is so public that even his own supporters have to denounce him. You know what I mean? But 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 what 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 could that fuck up be? Because they've they've know, literally man. said, they've literally said when when asked that you could take Trump could take somebody out in the street and kill them in cold blood and they would still support him. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, man. so I'm... it's like, um, but I mean, like, look, the guy's only going to be there for four more years. So you know. But the you know, I mean, I don't know the Supreme Court. That, well, dude, and he's like, uh, just like that whole trillion dollar. Uh, bailout or something he just like fired the dude that was supposed to be the oversight for that and well, like he's just I like mean, picking all these people out that are like all of the checks and balances he's just fucking yeah. firing them and shit and it's like I, like people are like all of these watchdogs are sounding the alarm it's like dude this is not good like this is like dictator shit like he is pushing us into authoritarianism and i don't believe that it is trump i've never believed it's the president the presidents are always the puppet it's like there's somebody behind the strings the scenes pulling the strings because trump well, it's the is big so money, he's man. so it's e- the big yeah. money that, yeah. that you know they they tell him like look we'll give you this money we'll give you this we'll let you you know build this here we'll let you build that there it, it, and yeah, I mean, he's making decisions that are best for him, you know, just like uh, calling this, uh, uh, you know, the the pandemic originally calling it a hoax and saying that it was, you know, Democrat induced and this, that and the other. And it's like, you know, now he's doing everything in his power to be like, I never said that. I never mm-hmm. did that. You know, and it's like, well, all right, man, whatever, <laughs> you know, but I mean, the, the, the Democrats aren't um, innocent either. I mean, oh, yeah. no, no, no. In, the beginning, Not at all. in the beginning of this, Pelosi was telling people to to go to Chinatown and, and you know, not pay attention. And, you know, so it's like, you know, people people want to think that, like, well, the Democrats are saints. And it's like, well, you know what? They were saying that this shit was a hoax in the beginning, too. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And then it's like you get deeper and it's just like, yeah, there's it's big money corporate interests that are really yeah. like it's like we don't have we're basically living in like corporate fascism. Like we don't have, there, there's no, like, if we knew what was happening behind the scenes, it's like, I watch a lot of like uh, documentaries, like dirty money and stuff. And it's just like the sheer level of audacious corruption and, and fuckery that happens in corporate America is it's like, Oh my God. And that's how they get away with it. Because you're like, there's no way that these big companies would do that. But it's like, Yes, they would because they can because they're too big to fail and they know that you think that they would never do that, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like, ah, uh, it's like Jared Kushner, dude. There was an episode on him and it's like, he's like a slumlord, man. And and he he's the one in charge of this fucking pandemic. Like, oh, geez, dude. I don't know. I just, I, I think, I think his hubris is going to bite him in the ass. And, and that's why I'm, I'm wondering, like, is it better if he just because like something's about to fall like this this house of cards that is America is about to topple, and if if Bernie were to take uh, to to win right now, it's gonna fall all on top of him, and then progressive ideas are just gonna. I don't be think it's gonna fall that soon. You, you know, I don't so? think it's gonna fall that soon. No, mm-hmm. no, it takes a lot longer for stuff like that to happen. I I think if it does happen, uh, it's not. It, it's probably gonna be not even the next president, but probably the one following that. I mean, you're looking at like an eight to 10 year swing for stuff like that. The the thing that I think is, um, you know, like we were talking about earlier is again, if you look at the statistics, if you, if you look at, um, uh, the way that they're predicting the economy to turn around in 2021 and the fact that, you know, Trump's getting more popular and people actually 
a lot of people actually believe that he's handling this, you know, well, uh, from those standpoints, he's, he's sitting to look at like in 2021 to kind of come out of this to the people who like him looking as though, you know, he did everything great. He got yeah, us this huge economic rebound. Cause you know how he's going to talk about it. I know. You know, like whenever, whenever the, whenever the, um, uh, the stock market has a downturn, I don't follow the stocks. I look at the unemployment rate. I look at this. I look at that. And as soon as the stock market has a good day, that's all he talks about. Yeah. And tweets about, you know, so people believe the rhetoric and nobody, nobody tries to fact check. And even when you do, it's hard to find the quote unquote real facts. But, you know, like the IMF has said, like, we're posed for 2021, the, 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 uh, second through the last quarter of 2021 to have an enormous economic rebound. If that happens, then he's going to take all the credit for it. He's going to look like the guy who saved everybody. Yeah. You know, what's crazy too. is like, it's very possible that, you know, cause the stock market is not the economy. Uh, it's very possible that they, no, it's, it's a fact. It's one factor. It just like, just like um, stocks and bonds are one factor, and yeah. just you know, like. But you know, uh, it's, but it's very like I, the the possibility that they could have deliberately crashed the stock market and then just deliberately like bring it. You know what I mean? It's like we have there's no we don't know how much control that they have over it because it's fucking corporate America fuckery. Like they're they're well, so good at this you, shit. You can't you can't say that they didn't play a part in it because there Honestly. were the um, politicians that got in trouble. Yeah, for fucking insider selling. trading, dude. Like. So, you know, there is definitely part of that. And then the thing is, is when it, when enough people in power panic sell, it does drive the stocks down. They make a profit, they sell, and then they buy back at a lower rate. And that's one of the ways that, you know, they, that the market can be played. Yeah. It's just like, man, there's just so much, everything's so fucked. <laughs> it's like, and I just, I, I look at it and it's like, it makes my heart weep because it's like, how did we get, so, how did things get so fucked up? It depends on how it depends on how um, how much you want to uh, straddle the line of of hyperbole, you know, because you could go all the way back to Washington when he said that a, a bipartisan government would be the downfall of democracy. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I think it's a uh, it's definitely a uh, two party system is not doing us any favors for sure. You there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh yeah, I don't know, man. How's your drawing going? <laughs> All right. I've been you know, I talk a lot with my hands, so I'm not as, as much <laughs> each, each one of these should have probably taken me like I don't know, twenty five, thirty minutes tops and uh I don't have any of them done yet. <laughs> oh, you haven't finished any yet. <laughs> no, I'm jumping around a lot though too. Uh, yeah. but I, I have these kind of conversations. I know you know, that's one thing is like um, I always consider myself like not a very social person, mm -hmm. but I do tattoo, you know, uh, every once in a while. And right now I can't. And I, I think like I would normally have conversations, you know, I, I know my customers well, so like I wouldn't talk politics with somebody I didn't know or anything, but sure. there's always stuff I can talk about and, and things that I'm passionate about or, or interested in that I can talk about. And man, I haven't got to do that in three weeks or something. And it's like, man, I, I, I realized like, I'm maybe I'm not as introverted as I thought I was. Maybe I can get my social fix from clients. <laughs> wow. I, I really miss it. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I think we should, uh, we should do these more often. Cause this is pretty fun. You say that all the time, I know, but, but every time, every time I'm like, when do you want to do it? You're like, let me check my schedule. And then I don't hear back from you. Yeah. Well, we're here right now, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there you go. It didn't take uh, too awfully long yeah. to get you to do it. I only I only asked every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, what the idea? Because you like sometimes you don't text me too. Like the other day we were supposed to do it, you didn't text me. But you said you said I'll call you, and I said that. text me in the text me earlier too to make sure in case I get to the studio earlier and you never got a hold of me. I don't know, man. And I, I did send you a text. It wasn't related to, uh, the, the podcast, but I did send you a text and still didn't get anything back until this morning. Yeah, dude, I, I'm lucky if I can like understand where I'm at half the time. <laughs> 
give my, my, my days my, best. my days are always the same so it's not hard for me yeah I, nothing nothing changed. i'm constantly thinking of fucking five different things constantly scheming about something and like it's like oh i'm doing that too yeah i mean that's i like i told you i think that's been part of my problem lately is that um i've gotten to that point to where like I have so many ideas and, and I've seen this happen and I bitched about other people that I've seen them do it to themselves where like you sort of kneecap yourself because you have all these ideas you want to pursue, which is cool, but you never finish any of them, mm. you know, and that's where I'm, that's where I'm, I'm like, I'm falling into that, you know, because I mean, I worked on the game for two and a half years, a little over and it's not far from being done. But then I started like half assing pieces. Because I, I just got to that point where I was like, man, I, I, this is all I've done. You know, I started, I missed, I started to miss sculpting and I started to miss, you know, painting different subject matter. And, and I just started to handicap myself. And it's like, man, that's like, that's a problem. Like, I want to be able to just commit. But that, I mean, that was obvious to my defense, not an excuse, but to my defense, that was a huge project yeah. to build a game from the ground up. Yeah, and totally. You know, it it's just, it is almost done and will get done. It's not like I've abandoned the project, but boy, uh, I get down on myself because I'm like, why don't I just finish that? Why do I have to jump on a you know graphic novel or learn a new style or pick up a new medium? Why can't I just focus on one thing? Now I just you, have too many ideas. I so I you. definitely kneecap myself all the time. Yeah, it's like, dude, I'll like just like editing uh, one episode of like Beyond Bizarro Go Go, and I'm like. I only work on it for like two days and it's like, uh, I feel like I'm dying. Cause it's like the same thing. And I'm like, Oh, I just want to be done with it. And it's like, oh. I can't, I can't yeah. I did, like my attention span for one project is so bad. I think like, uh. that, that has been, that has been my easiest reason for, um, not doing the social media stuff is mm-hmm. cause I'll be like, all right, well I do one piece of art, but then I spend one day editing it one day recording audio for it, you know, one day editing the audio for it. And then, so now it, I, instead of doing four pieces of art, I've done one. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, now I don't want to do this anymore. And then I, and I give up on it. Cause there's been, there's been more false starts than I want to admit to with doing this stuff, you know? Uh-huh. And even now I'm fighting to not do it. You know, I'm, I'm just like, I'm just like, I don't want to do this. I could, I could have gotten, you know, three more pages on my comic done, but instead I'm, I'm over here trying to edit videos for a Patreon, <laughs> you know? And like, look, I, I have, I do know people who are doing well because of all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But you know, when I talk to these guys, they're like, well, you know, you pretty much have to just tell yourself you're going to take a loss for three years. And I'm like, well, that's great. If you've got somebody bringing in another income, or you have a, a huge savings. Like I destroyed my savings going to school. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I don't have three years to not earn income. Yeah. And then that, that puts a big problem on it because it's like, well, that's kind of what it takes. You get, it takes a long time to build up that following in most cases. And then it's like, then I get down on myself again and I'm like, well, do I, do I still want to even attempt this? Because I can't devote three years to doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like I. <laughs> it's a young man's game, Dig. Yeah. You're young still. You 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 got a you got a shot, and uh, oh, I got an old lady and a kid. Don't act like you don't have a shot. Get out of here. No, no. I mean, as far as like you you could you could do the whole struggle for three years and and not really sink anything. You oh, know what I mean? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like I I don't I couldn't I couldn't. That's what I mean by it. I I, gotcha. I, I couldn't. I just I just literally couldn't do that i could not put my family through that and uh so that that gets very disheartening because when you hear that's what it takes which i believe because everything takes sacrifice mm-hmm. it's like shit man i I think i kind of missed the boat on that one yeah well i mean luckily i don't know i've been getting more into this like spiritual component and it's like really uh, it's really good for my mental health man like i'm just like so chill about things now it's like i know that if i just keep doing what i'm supposed to like cre- keep creating like somewhere along the lines it's gonna take off i don't know how yet but i know it is so i don't know it's a good spot to be in oh like, i i believe yeah I, i'm not i mean i i've sounded all poo-pooey during this and it's easy to be poo-pooey when when 
Well, it's a poo pooey time. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Like, um, but overall, I know I I never doubt my ability, mm-hmm. and and there is always going to be, regardless of what evidence you put in front of me, there is always going to be that part of me that goes, if you do good work and you bust your ass, you'll get a job, you know, mm-hmm. and that's I have my whole life, you know, and 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 I haven't always done the best work, but I've usually outworked everybody around me. Mm-hmm. And that that alone has gotten me work. So I know that I can get work. My problem, like I said, on my end is more of an identity crisis. It's yeah. like, okay, well, if I want to work doing this, right? Let's say, say I want to pursue the the more animated style, which alienates the majority of my fan base mm-hmm. that I've spent twenty years building. <laughs> um, I don't even know how to pursue that mm-hmm. because the, the idea is like right now because I have a. a I do the realistic style. And so I know what art directors to contact. I know what companies to contact. I have a rapport with certain people. I've done this. I've done that. If I were to pursue this newer style, then it's like, okay, well, who do I contact? What, what kind of companies are even hiring for that? What art director do I talk to? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's not like this isn't stuff. You just can't Google that kind of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, it gets, it gets really a little overwhelming uh, on, on one hand, because it's kind of like, I don't, I just don't know what to do. I've been doing the same thing for over two decades. I don't really know where to go now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel you, man. Like I, someday, even though like I'm saying I'm all like Zen and like stuff, it's, it's like still like pretty much a daily, like, all right, is this going to be the day that I figure out yeah. what I'm doing or, you know, Nope. Okay. Well, <laughs> maybe tomorrow you know it's like it's tough man it, it really is like i it's i mean maybe we talked about this last time but it's like the creative path is definitely not easy but it it's i it's the most rewarding you know like i couldn't imagine yeah. myself doing I, anything I, else no i couldn't i mean i think that's what it takes to be successful as a creative too is that like you can't you like there's not aside from my son i can't see anything that would force me to walk away from being a creative. I just can't, I don't, I don't really know what situation I couldn't think of a single situation you could present me with that would stop me from being a creative. And I, and I honestly and truly believe it takes that level of commitment if you're going to be successful, because I do know a lot of people who have gotten very successful at art. And I've been really lucky that because it does help you. It does help you motivate you when you can be, when you, you hear all the negative shit about people who fail at art. But when you start knowing all these people who are successful, you're like, yeah, you can do it. You can do it. And the one constant that I have always found is that these people just literally couldn't give up even if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, that's, it's... that's how I see myself, man. Like, and that, that's not hyperbole or me toot my own horn or anything like that. Like I just, I honestly wouldn't even know, what to do with myself if I couldn't do art. Yeah, dude, me neither. I, like... I, would do, I would do whatever it took to support my family. Don't get me wrong. If I had to go work at Target, I would. But then you better believe that the second I walk through the door when I get home, I'm going to start drawing, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny because, and, like, honestly, like, until this conversation, I had never even thought about what I would do besides something art artistic. You know, it's like I cannot... I, I see no other, I, like, I would be completely lost. If I lost my hands, like, I would be like, fuck, yeah. what am I doing well, now, that was, man? <laughs> like, that was a big problem with me mentally when I got into the accident. Yeah. was because, you know, it's like, what if my hands go now? Because I have, you know, all that damage to the tendons and ligaments in my hand. And mm-hmm. it's like, shit, man, what if my hands go? What do I do? And then you start thinking of things from, like, a a, a logistical standpoint. It's like, well, all I've done since I've been in my early 20s is be an artist. And, and for 14 years now, I've been a freelance artist. So you go like, well, if I went to get a job, who the fuck's even going to hire me? (laughs) I have nothing to put on a resume and my (laughs) hands are tattooed. You know, it's like, yeah, start thinking about that stuff. And it's like, boy, I, I, I don't, even if I wanted to stop being an artist, I better not (laughs) (laughs) really, uh, really committed to this one, huh? Yeah, <laughs> and it's it, funny it's because honest. like, it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, I feel like we've, we've 
intuitively, subconsciously just committed. It's not like you ever thought like, oh, I'm getting these tattoos on my hands. I guess I can't, you know, it's no, like, I you're... Did. that's exactly why I got my hands. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. yeah so I mean... when the recession, when the recession, so I don't know if you remember or not, but I'll just talk about it anyways. Oh yeah. I think um, it, yeah. You did tell me this story last time. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I had a corporate job and, uh, I was working a corporate gig and I had completely stopped doing art because I totally bought into that whole, Hey buddy, you gave it a shot. It didn't work out. Now you got to go be a grown up. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, for five, six years stopped doing art except for like drawing for my friends here or there, you know, like that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. Um, but nothing serious, nothing that was going to help me get better or build a career of any kind. Mm-hmm. So, um, then the economy hit the shitter and my job started to take everything away. They took away our retirement and they took away our PMs. And I, I was a sales rep for a company and you know, like I was demanded to go to more stores because they had to start getting rid of people because the economy wasn't doing well. I was demanded more work with less out of it. And I just was like, man, fuck this. So, uh, the first thing I did when I quit was cause I was like, man, if, if I can't, if I'm going to not get paid and then I might as well do something I like and not get paid. Mm-hmm. And so that I, when I decided like, okay, I'm going to be an artist, some kind of artist, this is, this is what's going to happen. Nothing's changing this. That's the first thing I did. So I could never give up and go back to a corporate job. Yeah. I remember. So that I did, I did, I that's did true. actually think about it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Me, I feel like I've just, I, I've like in like just subconsciously went all in. I never made like a, a, uh, but it's like I am completely. Did you always have a support network. What's that? Did you always have a support network? No, no. I like, just uh, like like people were people always encouraging of it and uh, like oh, yeah you should saying. do that. Uh, no, actually because when I moved, I didn't have that. Yeah, when I moved out to LA, no, I was on my own, dude. Like everybody. Uh, but I mean, like even your family or anything. Oh, because I mean, see, like me growing up was sort of like. Uh, you know, I come from an old, kind of old school Midwestern family. And it, for me, it was, it was more like, you know, my grandma was very artistic and, and I did like the arts at a young age, mm-hmm. but my dad was very much the mentality of like, no son of mine is going to be a queer and I wasn't allowed to do it. Uh-huh. And so I never had a support network that was like, you know, chase it, try, you know, or even, yeah, even encouraging, yeah, I got you. did it. And so it was easier for me to buy into the rhetoric of you tried, you should quit because there was nobody there who was like, you know, keep going or anything like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely, yeah, I definitely was uh, fortunate to have a family that, you know, like they might not have understood me, but they were definitely supported me. Uh, well, supported my decisions, even though they didn't understand it, you know? Um Yeah. Which is great, and that that's an awesome thing to have. And and I'm always envious of people who have had that. Uh, so I mean, you know, that's why I would encourage my kid, no matter what he wanted to do, yeah, as long as he worked at it and had a passion for it. Just because it's like I didn't have that, and I know how much that handicapped me. Yeah, you know, it's like I can't I can't understand people like parents that like. Uh, I think a lot of parents get hung up on this idea that they're trying to make uh, raise a copy of themselves, but really they're trying to raise an individual separate from them, you know? And it's like, if yeah. you understand that as a parent, you're going to save your kids so much fucking mental anguish. You just support whatever they're into, lot, you know? I think, lot, I think a lot has changed with our generation on that well, ideology. Yeah, but me know? and Randy, but, we were talking about, like, we've our generation has completely redefined what it means to be parents because our parents yeah. were like not supportive of us really at all as a whole, well, you know, even look at the mentality of most parents before us, like, like I'm 40 and I do not act any, my parents did at 40 <laughs> or my grandparents did. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it was like a whole different attitude on life. Like just how stern they were and how serious everything was. And so, I mean, I think we're just completely different, but I think the other thing that uh really really helps is we realize i i don't know how to say this like i think when when at least for me when my parents were kids it was sort of beat into them you know like the good job to have is to go work at a factory the good thing to do is you know you put in your you put in your time you retire and then you travel the world whatever you know like yeah. uh, whatever it is you just do but 
my generation knows that doesn't exist. Yeah. There are no fax jobs that allow you to buy a home, have two cars, put your kid through. It doesn't exist now. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's no way anybody in my generation is going to be like, Hey son, you need to go work at GM because that's a guaranteed job and uncle Jerry can get you in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it doesn't, it isn't a thing now. So it's, the mentality has changed and therefore we're not forcing our kids to follow in those footsteps because those footsteps, if they did work for us, we're smart enough to know they're not going to work for the younger generation. And in most cases, those wouldn't have worked for us. Yeah. You know, cause I was still in high school when the big crash hit where they closed down, you know, the GM and, and uh, all the steel industry in Ohio went out of business. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, I wasn't in high school. I had graduated, but I was like 16, 17. And uh, I remember, you know, like my then girlfriend's dad being laid off, you know, and he'd been there for like 15, 17 years, you know, and it's just like, I remember when all that folded. And mm -hmm. so there's no way that I would ever go, you know, go to my kid, which was said to me by even my guidance counselors in school. I would, there's no way I would go to my kid and be like, that's the, that's the secure thing to do. That's the responsible thing to do because mm -hmm. I, I lived through it and I know that. Yeah. But every generation before us, I mean, that's even how school's set up. And I'm, I'm, this is not a new thought by any means by me, but you know, there have been a lot of people who brought it up that even our schools, they haven't adapted to the way things are today. Yeah. They were originally set up to put us in mind of being a factory worker. Yep. Absolutely. You know, the, Punching in the, you know, the, the having the lunch breaks, the having, you know, it was like, it was basically training for going to work at a factory and now that stuff doesn't exist, but the schools haven't changed. Yeah. And you know, it's part of the reason why the kids are, you know, falling behind on stuff is because we're, it's an antiquated system that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, dude, they, they need to be teaching like coding in schools and all kinds of shit, man. Like, uh, like... there's a guy, I think we talked about this last time, but, um, will I am is actually one of the biggest guys pushing that of all people. Oh, really? Because yeah, because uh, something I, if I remember right, this was a long time ago now, but I, I think I remember reading that like he was on tour and he started to notice that in every other country, every other first world country, they were teaching coding the kids. And then he came back and was like, in the U.S., they're not, they're not, it's not even in the dialogue, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what's fucked up is like the uh, America, like, I mean, we should be teaching kids to be bilingual in like schools, like it should yeah. be options yeah. in like, you know, and like. Yeah, um, one of the only countries that doesn't do that. Yeah, and like, and dude, you know, the originally like the student loan program was developed so that it would help us like basically fight the Russians in like intellectual thought. Like we were trying to better our society. But then all of the fucking loan companies have become like predatory. And now we're just, we're kneecapping yeah. America. Like before we even start crippling debt and predatory loan companies. Yeah. It's like right I, out the one gate. Of my, one of my favorite things to hear is how like, um, if we had like free free college, it, it just wouldn't work. And I'm like, really? Because I most of my friends have gone to college for free because I have a lot of friends, you know, in other countries, uh -huh. and and it's working fine over there. Yeah, I and know. you know what? I have I have just as many friends who didn't go to college because that's the other thing they say is, oh, our colleges would be overrun and everybody would go. No, <laughs> no, they wouldn't. Yeah, I there's know. a lot of people who would go even if it's free. That's not for me. I'm not going to do that. Yep. But at least the people who did want to go would have that opportunity. Yep. And they would like, they wouldn't come right out of school with a bunch of fucking debt, man. Yeah. Yeah. Cause boy, how do you expect kids to pay that back? I don't know, dude. I'm still but, in debt, man. But when I talk to, when I talk to my friends, you know, they, they, they basically are like, yeah, the minimum just comes out of my check every week and I'll just do that until I'm dead. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Like, it's like, it's, it's insane. It's insane that we would even. I don't know. It's just insanity, man. And that's part of that systemic there's, there's, change that needs to happen for sure. Yeah. There's a, there's a large part of me that wishes I could have gone to school when I was younger. You know, when I w went to school and I seen all these young kids there and I'm like, God, man, if I, if I, if I was young and able to go to school, I would be crushing it now, you know? Mm -hmm. But then there's, there's, there is a, a small, it's a smaller part of me because <laughs> I don't think about it in a, in a, in a very, uh, responsible way but there it is still there there's that smaller part of me that's like you know what i'm kind of lucky i didn't go to school because there's no way i would have had to take out loan after loan after loan after loan after loan to go to a good school mm -hmm. and learn what i wanted to learn you know a lot of the kids that i went to school with they come from you know pretty 
uh, affluent backgrounds. And, and that was, that's not even an issue, but I didn't. And there's no way I could have done that without taking out a million loans. And I'm, I'm glad that I didn't do that at least because chances are I, I was so ignorant of what was and what wasn't good or bad art mm -hmm. that I would have went to a shitty school anyways. You know, I would have went to an art institute or something. Um, but even if I didn't, even if I got lucked out and went to a good school, man, the amount of debt that I would have, I, I don't even know. I, I, just, I, I, I don't know. I've been really lucky and never really been in debt in my life. And, and, uh, and I, I don't know how kids deal with that from a mental aspect. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Could you imagine you're, you're 20 years old, you get out of school, you're getting ready to go get your dream job. You find out that it's going to pay 65,000 a year if you're lucky starting out. And, and then you look at the bill you get every month on student loans, like mentally, I don't know how kids can handle that. Yeah. It's, that, that would be enough not a good right feeling. there. To, I'll tell would, you, it sucks. Be, <laughs> like it sucks. Well, it would be so disheartening. I honestly, I just, um, I don't think I would be able to do it. I, I, I don't think I would be able to cope. No. It, it's just, it's almost like you do all the things you're supposed to do to have a chance for success. And then a syst the system that's in place steps up and says, yeah, but you're never going to have success because we've put this huge hurdle that you can't possibly overcome in front of you. Yeah. And well, and I think that's why, like the, I feel like that's why, I mean, like we've become so materialistic because like, I think the system is set up to keep rich and famous people. We, we idolize them. Their lives must be so great. Oh, I want to strive for that. And then it's this carrot that's dangling because if I had money, my life would be better. I would feel fulfilled. But actually, rich and famous people, their lives are just as shitty and empty as anybody else's. They just have a lot more money to like paint a happy face on, you know? It's, and, it's, it's what you do with the money. Because I do know a lot of very all right, wealthy that's a people. Broad, okay, I will admit, that's a broad, yeah. like, overarching statement. Yeah. But I'm just... It, I'm it's, just it's how you handle your money. Sure, absolutely. You know, because my, my, one, of, one of my closest friends is very, very well off. And uh, he'll never hurt for money. But, you know, when he goes in and talks to his financial team, they say things to him like, you spend in a year what most of our clients spend in a weekend. Wow. You know, if you live like that, you'll be fine. It's because a lot, it, you know, if you, when most people say, when most people refer to, I'm talking about wealthy people, what they really mean is I'm talking about celebrities. Yeah. And sure. when you're talking about celebrities, which are not even close to the wealthiest people in the world, when you're talking about celebrities, that comes with a whole bag of garbage of most celebrities have it in their heads that you have to uphold a certain look a certain aesthetic, a certain this, a certain that, in order to be relevant in that microverse. Yeah. Which isn't true because there are, there, there are those that, especially ones that live outside of the country, that it show that's not the case. But even here, like you got guys like Keanu Reeves, however you feel about him as an actor, mm -hmm. he, for what he's worth, he lives so far below his means and the guy just lives a total stress-free life because of it because he doesn't feel he has to uphold that Hollywood standard. You know, yeah. when you, when you want to look at well, I think well, that's that's uh, you're you're touching on what the point that I was trying to make is that that Hollywood standard, that like that materialism, that that need to uphold some kind of bullshit something is what people chase. It's like the normal people are chasing that, so then they buy I, things to make themselves feel better, even when they're not rich. It's like why feel, we have a materialistic society. You know, it's like the the idea of things make you happy is is something that so many people chase. But they're getting kneecapped from the gates because if they yeah. were to achieve that, they would realize that there is no fulfillment in the things. No. And but that's but, why, you know, that's yeah. at the, the same time. The, the only reason I kind of uh, butted in and said anything when you brought that up was because at the same time, you know, like I grew up poor. I grew up homeless. I grew up I had to live under a bridge for a while. And I can tell you that were we to have financial stability, a lot of the turmoil in my young life would not have happened. So that was the only reason that I, I came in because being wealthy and successful doesn't mean you're going to be as miserable as everybody else. If you're as miserable as everybody else, you did it to your damn self. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, and you're right. It is, it is, that's like a, it, that was a, um, a bold example of the point I was trying to make because it's, it's definitely an overstatement, but it, you get what I'm saying is like this, the materialistic society, a lot of people oh, believe and that. I, and I think, 
I think especially in this in this new era of um, social importance, I think even more so. Yeah, you know, like because, the, the influencers and the, you know. Yes. Yeah, because now it's now it's like, oh, I have to look this way and I have to do these things and I have to have those things or I'll never get enough followers to be Kim Kardashian or, you know, whatever. And it, the only reason that I'm singling her out, one is because everybody knows who she is. But the other is because of that study that's been well publicized where they asked uh, young people what they wanted to be when they grew up. And the number one answer by most little girls was Kim Kardashian. Yeah. Yep. You know, and, and they compare that to studies of like where girls would say things like, I want to be a nurse or I want to be this or I want to be that. that those aren't the answers that are given nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so when you put that kind of importance on that kind of aesthetic and that sort of lifestyle, and that's what you think is success and what you think is wealth and happiness, then that, that even becomes amplified even more so on the material side, because now it's like, well, Kim's doing this. I don't want to keep using her name. So and so, so and so is doing this, and so now I have to do that, and yep. so it's even more so amplified, you know. Yep, and then it creates these things like, uh, like the fast fast fashion industry that are actually destroying the planet because yeah. of the. They're like, oh, somebody, some celebrity wore this, so let's make a really cheap knockoff version with it, and then like told that's like bullshit clothes anyways. And it like literally like if if viewers don't know about it, the fast fashion industry is another uh, it's plaguing the environment. It's like a horrible for the environment. And it's like it's just a, one of those things that's like it's so ridiculously absurd. It's like, do we need that? No, we don't. We don't need that, you know, but it's like huge and it's fucking things up hardcore. I mean, there's that's that's, um, that's a lot of a young person thing, too, though. Right. Because like I think for most adults not all but for most adults you sort of hit that age for most normal adults i, I don't want to say like celebrities and stuff like that people who feel like they have to uphold a certain image but for most normal adults you, you kind of hit that age where you don't care so much about fashion anymore mm -hmm. you know what i mean or you or you get your own dis, your own uh style and then and then a lot of times that isn't influenced by what's the hottest thing out right now i sure. think it's it's a lot of young people Oh yeah, definitely. Who, and the, 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 definitely the people that are susceptible that. to that, the influencer yeah. Yeah, influence. Yeah. yeah. That's why, you know, it's like, it's honestly like one of the, the biggest reasons that I want to, I want to kind of like blow up and make a name for myself is because like uh, people, no matter what, if you do something that resonates with people, they, they put you on a pedestal no matter what. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not interested in the pedestal. I'm interested in the platform. Because I, yeah. I want to show people, like, I want people to hear my message of, like, look, man, like, I'm not better than you. Like, I want to pull people up to that platform and show you, like, look, guys, like, we're all in this together. Like, I'm just a dude. Like, this is what's important. Like, find your own way. Like, you know, like, this is the message I'm trying to promote. And that's the only, like, one of the big driving factors of why I even want to make a name for myself, you know? Yeah. I mean, my my main driving factor is because I just want to start a nonprofit that allow kids who grew up in my situation or similar. Mm -hmm. I can't say. I mean, nobody, everybody has their own thing. But um, in a situation similar to mine, to have the opportunity to go to a place like Watts before they're 40. Yeah. I you think know, that's, awesome, that's yeah. I mean, that's that's my main reason for wanting to be that. I mean, obviously, I want to provide a good life for my kid and, and Ashley and whatnot. But that's I mean, that's going to happen regardless. Like I, we don't I mean, right now things are shit, but I know they're going to get better. And, you know, we we've never really as bad as things have gotten in the last couple of years since I got out of school. Things have taken a huge financial downturn, um, but it's still never been to the point to where it's been like, oh, we might end up homeless or any of the shit that I had to put up with as a kid, you know? Yeah. So um, but I would say aside from providing for my family, the 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 number one reason why is because I really want to be able to give kids who, you know, not only don't have the opportunity to do a school like I did, but also even if they had the opportunity, some magic way, wouldn't even know. Like I didn't find out about Watts until I was 36, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I lived in his backyard basically and didn't even know. <laughs> and so it's like, I want to give that opportunity to somebody yeah. And see, you know, maybe maybe you could take that guy who is like me and you could, you know, make that dude who is the next greatest thing. That would be awesome to have a, a hand in that on in some level. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, dude, that's what I'm saying. And then like, and that's a big part of my message too. Is like, I try to reach those people in those those kids in those small towns of like, hey man, like embrace your weirdness because your weirdness is what's gonna fucking take you to all the cool places in life. You know? It's yeah. Like, uh, for me, I don't I don't say weirdness, but what I say is embrace your um, imagination because yeah. our, our imagination would beat out of us. But when you look at the people who become successful in the arts, for the most part, they're the creatives because make no mistake about it. There is that dude who can come in and well, I'll equate this to music who can come in and play that music flawless every time he sits down, but he can't write a song to save his life. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, that guy who maybe he isn't the greatest, but the guy's an innovator and he's creative and he creates a new genre or he cr writes new songs and he just kills it. And that's the guy who makes it. That's not to say the other guy doesn't do well, but he's not necessarily the guy who's going to be desired, sought after and taken on the road, mm -hmm. you know, or, or in, in the case of like uh, in my world in art, it, it, it's, it's a lot of like the great artists are the guys that end up getting hired after the guys with the great ideas lay the foundation, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, yes, it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of work and a lot of struggle and strife and yada, yada, yada to become one of those guys, you know, like a two percenter. But if they don't have any ideas, they're always going to work for somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the guy with the idea is going to be the guy who is going to end up hiring them Yeah. or, you know, and, and that's, that's the thing. That's, that's one thing that like being around a lot of tremendous artists showed me was how few of them actually had ideas. And then I was like, shit, man, I got seven notebooks of ideas. Like I'm <laughs> never going to compete with these guys on a technical because they're amazing and they've had decades more experience than me, but they're not even trying to put out their own ideas. And that's where I might have a chance, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so I always tell people like, just, I mean, it took me a long time to realize that. And, you know, I always just thought you had to be the best artist out there. And then I realized like, man, a lot of the guys that I look up to, they're not the best artists out there. They were just guys who had the ideas that I thought were the coolest. Mm hmm. Oh, well, on that note, I, I've got to go eat some. I'm getting hungry. But, uh, man, this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you want to uh, explain, because then I, when I cut this all together, it's going to be having your art there. You want to just like, so what did you paint? Or like, Because I can't see it oh, at this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, basically, all I'm working on is just, so I, I have my femme to tell for my story, which is weird. Um, she is still you know, the, the lead lady, if you will. But my main character is a, a jackalope. So <laughs> <laughs> like, she's not, he's, he's, he's not going to be, I don't know. I don't know what the future holds, man. These characters write themselves, but, uh, I don't, I don't think that he's going to be hooking up with this lady. Um, but I do, I, she is my lead lady, you know, like the, the murder that the first murder he gets drug into the first story arc is, uh, her sister. And, uh, I'm trying to figure her out because I, I wanted her to have more of like an olive skin. And, uh, I, I just had a very clear vision of what I wanted her to look like in my head, but it's in this newer style. Uh -huh. And so rather than just do my usual turnarounds and breakdowns for the characters for, you know, like a char uh, character sheet, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to have like a, a color reference as well. And so that's basically all it says. It's just four generic ex expressions with different head tilts and stuff that I'm going to uh, color in just as like a color breakdown. I'm not even worried about like, usually I'll play around with lighting scenarios, you know, up light one, bottom light one, you know, one mostly in shadow, whatever. I'm not even doing that. They're, they're all pretty generically lit. It's just really me figuring her out. Mm -hmm. But the reason that I'm doing it is just so I have a reference point so that I can save time in the long run when I'm drawing her in the book instead of having to try to figure it out then. Mm -hmm. And then to also put it up on my Patreon is, you know, is uh, kind of like this is my process on how I paint. This is what I'm thinking about while I'm trying to come up with these color scenarios because I don't really know that I have a lot of value as far as teaching goes to to people mm -hmm. other than I know I have a very unique perspective on color. Mm -hmm. And so Absolutely. most of what I'm going to talk about on there is going to be, you know, the ways that I come up with the colors that I come up with, how I lay them down, how I think about them versus a lot of what you're told of how you should think about it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's all this is. It's just really a breakdown of this character and 
you know, I've had her look kind of cemented for a while. I knew what I wanted her to look like, but I just didn't know what her colors would look like and things like that. Cool. So where can uh, people find you on the net so they can learn some Cecil Porter stuff? Where's, where do you put your tutorials at? Nowhere yet. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, uh, where are they going to be? I mean, I'll have the, the, you know, there's, there's the Gumroad is up now, but uh -huh. it only has one video. Okay. And, uh, it's just, if you just look for me, it's just me, you know, everything is just Cecil Porter. So, um, yeah, the like Patreon it. is just Cecil Porter and then the Gumroad is just Cecil Porter. So, so, uh, so patreon.com slash Cecil Porter. Yep. And gumroad.com slash Cecil Porter. Yep. Cool. Yep. And I'll yep. put the links in the show notes too. So you can yeah. click clickable links. And yeah, and I'll, I'll double check that too to make sure I didn't. Okay, yeah, just send anything. me the links. And also, if you guys are watching the, on the YouTube, uh, I'll have the links in the description of the video. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, and it'll also end up on my YouTube. All these will be like done in like quicker time lapses for the YouTube, and all the links will be below the videos there too. So if you see a specific one that you want to see the tutorial of or the longer version of, you could follow the link below that video and it'll take you straight to it on my Gumroad or my Patreon. Awesome. Dude, well, thanks for, uh, you know, joining me again. And, uh, like, yeah, I know I always say it, but we will. Yeah, let's do this more because that was fun. Like, we never tried this before. And, like, I had fun. I got, like, art done and I got to talk. And it's like I never get to see you anymore. So it was, it was nice. <laughs> it's like we're hanging out. Yeah. Doing I, smart. I, I think I told you last time, like, I did this a couple times with, with buddies um, or acquaintances or whatever for various things. And it, it was always kind of fun because – I'm, I'm used to talking while I'm drawing anyways. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, it allows me to feel less guilty about getting, not getting something done. Mm -hmm. And, and it also, uh, it always makes for a cooler video, I think. Yeah. It, I had a, you know, um, I, my, my painting was, uh, I, I have this, so there's these, uh, the, the bouncers. So demon shit phaser, the Jackie Dan hands, the guy that you tattooed on me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. so they, they summon demons to, while they, play their rock concerts and stuff uh and the like satan has sent along his like biker crew for, for their security and uh so the the biker gang is the unholy shits so <laughs> there's uh there's like horse shit ape shit and i, I painted <laughs> i painted bat shit so and he's nice. he's crazy looking so he's batshit crazy <laughs> so uh, nice. that's what i did today uh and if you're listening to this on the podcast again uh go see what cecil and i both have been drawing this whole time we've been talking at youtube.com slash rancig uh and then where else can people find you on on the online Do you... well I, it's just just look up my name it's a, it's my name for everything it's my name for youtube it's my name for instagram it's my name for everything the instagram is the artwork of cecil porter or cecil porter studios there's two uh and then the youtube is just my name awesome so it's pretty easy it's pretty easy to find me if you're interested in finding me you won't have a hard time <laughs> right on well thanks so much dude this has been really fun yeah man